Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. It's my job here to seek out the geniuses, the top people in their fields, interview them and get all the juicy goodness that they know about that other people don't know about. I've spoken to over 2,000 clinicians, scientists, researchers, and practitioners, and today I'm joined by Simon Sedidin. I hope I pronounced your name properly. Um, he's uh, part of the Murdoch Children's Research Institute, which owns the Victorian Clinical Genetic Services. Uh, he works in the bioinformatics side, so we're going to be talking today, and Simon, thank you for coming. Hi, Richard. It's great to be here. Yeah. So for people that don't know, what, uh, what is bioinformatics? And then I want to ask you, what's your job about specifically right now? Sure, yeah. Um, bioinformatics is a, is a really um, fascinating, really up-and-coming field that's come about in, I guess, the last 20 years or so because what's happened is we've started to be able to access uh, far more data about, I guess, biology than we ever could before. So, you know, we're in the fascinating situation now. We're in lots of fields across many different domains. We have way more data than uh, we know how to deal with, and we've actually developed a whole sort of uh, specialty, if you like, just doing data analysis of this uh, data that's originated from some kind of biological source. And um, it's got various different names. People will call it sometimes computational biology or uh, a few other different terms, but bioinformatics has sort of developed into one of the the big ones, the names that people use for this work. So, okay, in the context of your work right now, what is the bioinformatics side trying to figure out? What's it about figuring? Um, yeah, so we, um, as an organization, um, do genetic testing and genomic testing uh, for uh, uh, really for, for patients and parents who are either suffering from or at risk of suffering from uh, some kind of rare genetic disorder. Um, so the bioinformatics in that case, uh, what we're trying to do is to uh, generate uh, data somehow from some kind of instrument that can measure people's genomes or some kind of related activity within uh, their body um, and then uh, do the necessary uh, data analysis to uh, really inform a uh, result about what's actually happening that, that could either put them at risk or is affecting them already. All right. So specifically, what are some of the, uh, the things you're looking at? Like, what's your, again, what's your current position about? What are you looking at? Just genomics or other aspects? And uh, Yes. Yeah, so these days, um, uh, very much there's a huge focus on genomics. And uh, uh, I'm not sure how aware or your listeners would be, but, um, you know, we've really had quite a revolution, I guess, in the last uh, 10 years or so where we've gone from uh, being, um, you know, barely able to afford to, to sequence um, two or three genes, you know, in a, a patient to pretty much being able to afford to sequence their entire genomes. And um, that's just happened so quickly in some ways that it's almost sort of a, a, like a step change if you think about it that way. Um, and, so we're really in many ways in catch-up mode where the technologies move really fast. We've got all these amazing new uh, possibilities of what we can get out of the data that it's generating. And our you know, biggest challenge is to kind of um, keep up and get the software um, that we need um, working in a clinically robust and reliable way to get that um, that. Uh, um, patient with a result they can really, really trust. Um, so, you know, a lot of our work sits around uh, three different aspects. One, one is around um, building underlying infrastructure, and a lot of that sits in the regular sort of software development space where we've got databases, we've got workflow systems and automation systems and stuff like that. So there's all kind of work related to that. And then we've got 
another angle on it, which is really around innovation, where we, we know there's some signal in the data and um, can we get that out? And often there'll already be a lot of research going on about ways to try and get that signal out of the data. So, so we will be uh, looking at that research and trying to work out, you know, is this something we could really use clinically? Is it, is it reliable enough? Does it need more work? Do we have to invest perhaps in refining it a little bit, testing it, evaluating it? So there's a whole sort of arm around of, of what we do, which sits in that data analysis, data science space, um, looking at things, benchmarking things. Um, and then there's a, there's, a, there's a sort of necessary evil. It's, it's not really evil. It's, it's, it's actually incredibly important around making sure everything is done at a really high level of quality in the laboratory. So measuring, monitoring, operational um, side. Every patient that comes through, do the quality control, review what happened, have the automated systems that will pick up problems and uh, alert you if something's gone wrong and, and make sure that that gets addressed. So that's that's sort of a big sort of big picture span of of what we do, uh, you know, in the bioinformatics part of our laboratory. Well, so in the context of looking at uh, genomics, I mean, where are the the issues? Is it that now it's a conundrum because now we can sequence someone's whole genome and we're like drowning in data and we don't know what to do with it, or is it that I don't know the handling of the data and the privacy and the security of it's a big issue, or all these things? Uh, well, that's the fascinating thing is it's incredibly multidimensional, this, this, this problem we've got on, on many different fronts we're struggling to uh, deal with. Um, this, this sort of massive, you know, uh, change that's happened that that's lets us look at so much data. So you're absolutely right. Um, on the one hand, we have to learn how to scale up everything we do, you know, two orders, maybe three orders of magnitude um, to just to deal with the volume of data. And then because... Um, because genomics is now more affordable, more people want to do it. So we have more uh, patients, if you like. So we have to scale in all those different dimensions. Um, but all of that, just as you alluded to, you know, uh, flows downstream to all the complexities of dealing with um, really, really, really uh, complicated genetic disorders. Um, we, we are a highly ethical organization. Um, so we have in-house uh, clinical geneticists who will talk with patients and help them understand the implications of any result that they're given. But of course, that's really, really tough when you're in a situation where the technology is enabling you to come up with brand new results that, that maybe even the clinical geneticists are not well prepared to, to deal with. So there's, there's a huge a huge com complexity in, in how all of this is kind of uh, rolling out. And it's, um, it's a fascinating time to live in, really, to see everyone grappling with this change and to, and, and to really work together as a team to, to try and do all this stuff. So when you say, like, the, uh, the geneticists themselves don't know what to do with the data or maybe they're having surprising implications, like, what are some of the surprising things that have come out of, you know, this new treasure trove of data? Well... Yeah, I, I, you know, the, the, what's really challenging, I guess, is we don't always know uh, the full story about what a genetic result actually means. Um, it can be that it affects different people in different ways. It could be that um, maybe it doesn't affect everybody, but affects some people. Um, and so I think that that that's, introduces a lot of um, difficulties in, in how you relate that to a person on the other end who doesn't know anything about genetics and genomics um, and um, help them understand um, really what, what it means for them and their family. Um, it, it can be very, very tricky when, when the actual uh, underlying science is, is sort of still evolving on that front. Um, so, you know, I don't really work in the clinical genetics um, as a clinical geneticist, so I can't speak too much on their behalf. Um, I only know that um, we um, have to be, you know, uh, really partner with them and um, try and give them all the information they, they can um, possibly use. Um, but half of their job is all about, you know, the psychology of how, how people will be affected uh, by hearing certain information and, and all kinds of other dimensions like that. 
Um, any example that you've seen in talking to the clinicians? You know, something they, you know, do they, in order for you to do your job better, I'm sure they've given you like maybe some case studies or, you know, potential things that could happen to just make it real to you. Oh, well, I mean, the reality, one of, one of the big realities for us uh, we have to grapple with is uh, many patients don't want to know uh, about certain kinds of things. Um, so it's quite routine that um, we, we will have to um, actually black out some information because people um, really don't want to find out that they're going to have a sort of adult onset, you know, late onset, degenerative disorder something that would maybe make their life um you know become uh significantly shorter or affect them severely in their you know later part of their life um, so that's one reality that we we deal with all the time um and and it's a it's um it, it can be quite tricky because you can discover that information by accident and then 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 there's a a really tricky question of what is the uh ethically correct thing to do um if someone doesn't want to know um should you tell them or not and you can get into all kinds of philosophical discussions there about um you know what's right and wrong um and it's a very complex area that goes way beyond my um my remit in the organization so what do you think are going to be you know you talk about some of the issues um what about the data itself is it going to be private to that individual and they'll selectively share it with you know, researchers, or is it going to somehow become public? Is it going to become part of their health record? Will it be selectively disclosed? I mean, there's just, I guess there's a lot of issues surrounding the privacy of the data, the data itself too. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, patients at the moment, um, we, we will um, obviously generate their genomic data and we will store that um, and keep it. And even after they might have received a genetic result, uh, we will still keep that data um, in case it can be used again in the future. Um, we make it available um, on request. Um, and patients, when they come to us, have the opportunity to um, consent to having research done on their data. Um, and it's, 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 it's really uh, you know, rewarding to see that most patients want to do that. Um, most patients want to make the data available to help other people who have um, conditions like them. So um, in most cases, uh, we are able to uh, then pass that data on, especially if a case is unsolved. It can go downstream and researchers can then pick up that data and, and learn from it and one of, the, one of the fascinating things with genomics is that um, often you learn uh, as much from having lots of uh, cases that, uh, or, or if you like, controls for people who are not affected. Um, you, to find the answer in the people who are affected, you need lots and lots of examples of people who are not affected. So it makes a huge difference for people to share their data um, because that way researchers can um, look across different people who might be affected by different things, cross-correlate the data, figure out, you know, where is the statistical significance um, for the cases versus the controls and things like that. So um, data is that, asset, that element, um, although it's very, very sensitive, people are very positive about sharing their data. Um, and um, it's, there, there are many, many projects at the moment uh, going forward to enable that kind of sharing to happen at a bigger scale um, while making sure everyone's uh, privacy is protected. So what's, uh, what's the timeline for, I don't know, I guess the, the I, well, I guess both are evolving, you know, the, the, the work that you need to do to keep a hold on the data, you know, make sure the interpretations are, are right, store it, share it, et cetera. And, you know, so what do you see on the uh, the data creation side itself? Is the amount of information just going to go crazy and explode as people learn more about our, our genomes or what's your thoughts? Um, yeah, so I guess the, the explosion is in the process of happening. <laughs> um, and that's, that's really happening because we have seen the cost of data generation go down um, you know, roughly an order of magnitude, um, you know, in the last, I guess, five or six years. 
And so now it's becoming quite tractable to, um, to, to sequence someone's whole genome, even uh, for a relatively, um, uh, I guess, um, minor reason. And so people are now doing it a lot. And um, so, so that certainly is you know, causing this, this enormous uh, surge in, in data coming through and lots of challenges and just, just that sheer volume of it. Um, but there's lots of new technologies on the horizon as well. Um, so um, another angle on this is that uh, a big part of what we want to engage in is uh, figuring out um, how and when they're ready to be applied uh, in the clinical space. Um, there are some limitations to the, to the technologies we have now, um, certain kinds of uh, genetic mutations we can't resolve very well at all and um, some of those are actually quite common disorders so although we're celebrating in so many ways being able to look at all this wonderful data we we'll always have in mind that there are, there are certain types of conditions and certain types of uh, genetic mutations that are that are falling behind and there are some new technologies that could address that and so we're actively engaged in those um, um, to try and deploy them and, and help those patients too. Oh, do you have an example of what would be very difficult to, uh, you know, to see to figure out sequence? Yeah, so the, the, the big limitation at the moment with um, all the technologies used in the, in the clinical space is um, they do what we call short read sequencing. So if you think about the genome, um, as, a, if, as, as sort of a big, long string, if you like, of DNA, right? A big, long uh, collection of, of uh, letters, you know, big, long uh, string. Um, the technology we currently have requires us to chop that string up into little pieces uh, in order to read it. So, in fact, you know, what we end up with is little pieces of... Uh, uh, of DNA getting read that we can, we call these reads, but they're, you know, they're sort of about a hundred DNA nucleotides or bases long, right? hundred to 200 depends, but we can't really go much more than that. And what that means is that um, when we then try and look at that, um, certain kinds of mutations actually um, almost become invisible with that kind of data. Um, the, it, the problem we have is that uh, if we get a read out of the genome that's only about 200 nucleotides long, um, we then have to try and work out where did that actually come from in the person's genome in the first place? Um, because um, that 200 nucleotides, that could actually go in um, many different places. And for most, most mutations and most disorders, we can actually quite easily place it back in the genome because um, there'll be some unique part of that uh, 200 nucleotides that uh, exactly maps to somewhere in the genome. And so we can kind of put it back in its correct place, like a, a puzzle, a jigsaw puzzle piece. Um, but for some parts of the genome, which are really highly repetitive, um, we actually have many, many options for where that jigsaw puzzle piece could go. And that leads us to a very difficult problem because if you see a mutation in that piece of in that in that 200 nucleotides, um, you don't really know which gene it belongs to, right? It could come from one that causes a patient's condition, but it could quite easily come from somewhere else in their genome. So all of this, you know, really arises from the fact that we start with these short pieces of DNA um, that we that we read. Um, and that's where a lot of the progress is being made, where there are now what we call long read technologies, and they can read pieces of DNA anywhere up to 30 or 40 uh, kilobases long. Um, so that really uh, makes an enormous difference and, and means that we can see a whole genetic mutation in one sort of uh, continuous read that came off the sequencing machine and allow us to directly ascertain what happened instead of these little short fragments where we have to kind of piece it back together like a jigsaw puzzle and hope that we get the right picture at the end.
So that's the biggest space uh, where the, uh, we hope the technology will move in the next few years. Um, and there are some specific um, um, disorders that involve uh, what we call repeat expansions in the genome where you have a repetitive region and it just gets much, much longer um, that we, we think we will be able to address with those technologies. Do you think it'll get to the point where we can sequence the whole thing, you know, all three billion base pairs all at once without breaking it up into pieces? Uh, that's a that's a really interesting question. Um, it's it's probably unlikely we'll ever do the whole thing. Um, and to be honest, we would never really need to go too much beyond, um, you know, um, a few megabases, say, um, because um, then we can really always can piece it back together. Um, there's, uh, there are some incredibly difficult regions because they actually intersect with the, uh, the, uh, the, the centromere in the, um, chromosome, um, which is, um, really, really difficult to sequence through. Um, so it's quite unlikely we'll ever actually do whole chromosome sequencing, although I'd certainly never rule anything out. Okay. Interesting. What about the price of sequencing? Do you think it's going to keep going down till it's pennies or where do you think that's going to go? That's a, that's another fascinating question itself. Um, we've sort of reached the point where um, currently we, the, the, the raw sequencing cost to read someone's whole genome is now sitting above, but sort of, not far out of range of many of the traditional genomic tests that we would have done that only targeted a small number of genes. Um, so the fascinating question is, yeah, what happens if it really falls, uh, you know, another order of magnitude? Um, and um, at the moment, we don't know of anything specific that would make that happen, but it's, um, it's, it, it's happened before when we've thought that too. So, you know, um, it certainly looks quite possible that we'll see uh, another significant fall in, in sequencing costs. A lot of that is really driven by the sequencing um, industry. Um, and there's one sort of huge player there, which is Illumina. And Illumina um, have consistently shown that they've been able to improve their technology over time. Um, so uh, for us, um, we are very much um, uh, ready uh, to take up anything new that they're able to release, but um, they keep it quite close to their chest. Yeah, well, what's the, so you think things will fall by an order of magnitude in price? And if so, guess on the timeline and what's the implications you think they might be? Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, you know, I'd be completely guessing, to be honest. I, what I would say is I think it's entirely possible, um, but uh, I, I, I'm uh, well outside the um, circle of people who have that <laughs> inside information. Um, it's, it's, it, look, it's quite possible that that will happen. And if it does, the, the fascinating implication is that it will make genomic testing um, actually cheaper than many other traditional tests and so you could easily see things flip where um the currently what happens is if someone has something that looks like it could be a genetic disorder they you know go to the doctor and they say this is happening or that's happening they'll have a whole battery of other things done before anyone even talks about sequencing their genome um the the really fascinating thing you know if it becomes that cheap to sequence someone's genome that we may flip it it may flip over and we'll say well maybe the first thing we should do is a genomic test maybe that should be the first thing we should do um and then only when we don't get an answer out of that put the person through all of this other diagnostic um pathway which can be quite complicated and um expensive in itself um especially as we get better and better at doing this uh, genome sequencing, it may also become one of the fastest things we can do is to upfront sequence their genome and answer a whole lot of questions. So I think that's one of the, one of the, one of the really interesting things that could happen in the future. Um, another, another possibility there is that because sequencing someone's genome is something you only need to do once 
right? If you sequence their genome once, then you kind of know it forever. Um, it's not something that changes. Um, we could move into a space where um, if it's relatively cheap to do, it could be something that is, say, offered to people um, either at their first encounter with a, a medical condition that could be answered by genomic sequencing or even at birth, right? It could be that parents just have this done um, and then you end up in a, a really fascinating space where uh, that information is kept and is made available throughout their lives. Um, this is all very futuristic. There's no concrete plans for any of these things right now, um, but it's um, those are the kind of uh, exciting future possibilities that could happen and could really actually change uh, people's uh, medical care quite a lot. Well, very good. Well, what's the best way to find out more and to keep tabs on, you know, the work you're doing for VCGS and uh, Murdoch? I'll definitely go um, have a look at the um, the VCGS website, which is vcgs.org.au. Um, you can also go and look at the uh, Murdoch Children's Research um, Institute website. Um, so, uh, you know, as you mentioned, I, I work for both of them. And one of them is a is one of Australia's largest medical research institutes. That's the Murdoch Children's Research Institute. So we have a fantastic partnership where um, we have some of the world's leading researchers and they're, and they're feeding directly into our clinical laboratory where we're able to take advantage of everything they know, uh, all the techniques they use. We're able to learn from that as well. Um, so go have a look at those two, both of those websites, um, and you'll get a picture right across from the um, the um the you know the research the cutting edge research end right through to the kind of clinical testing we do um and you know i i i if i may i'd make a pitch for anyone who's you know sure. working in the in the, the software space um maybe the data science space if you're someone who's um you know looking for a a way to really exercise your skills in a, in, a, in a way that really generates enormous value for uh, patients and, and people who are in, in really um, situations of need. Um, there's a way for you to do that if you come into this field. And one of our, one of our big challenges is um, finding the people with the right cross-disciplinary sort of skills to, um, to um, be able to come in and, and absorb all of this complexity and, and then, you know, implement some of these things that are, you know, driving the field forward. So that's, that's a little bit of a pitch to anyone who's interested. I'd love to hear from anyone who's sort of in that position. Well, it sounds like a really interesting challenge in the world of computing, which I'm sure most people wouldn't think would apply to this, or they probably haven't made the connection themselves, but you know, if you're in the software world, yeah, I think it'd be really fascinating to do something like this. So it's a good idea. Absolutely. And that, I guess that was, uh, you know, uh, one of the things I was thinking about um, at some point you sort of mentioned, you know, are there, are there misconceptions and, you know, one of my, one of my, um, you know, sort of misconceptions that I think there are is that, is that firstly that this sort of area is inaccessible um, with, unless you've got, you know, an advanced PhD in genetics or something. Um, that's not true. Um, uh, another misconception is that it's sort of if you come into this in, into a clinical laboratory, life will be boring. Um, that's definitely not true. Um, you know, it's a it's an amazing field that's evolving really, really fast. And be, simply because of that, we need people with all kinds of different skills. Um, and there's a there's sort of a really good opportunity for people interested in the space to come in right now because there is such a high level of need. Um, so people are quite open minded about, you know, having people come in, upskilling them, getting them, getting them across new areas of knowledge. Um, so there, sorry, I've continued with my pitch. <laughs> well, Simon, thank you so much for coming. And it's, uh, you know, again, another, yet another world of, of information I didn't know anything about. So thank you for being here. Thanks, Richard. It's been a pleasure. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. 
This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.